Duke Gildenberg had access to top secret flight logs at White Sands and carried out the official investigation into the case. That very same day, we had a mission scheduled for the surveyor unmanned spacecraft uh, that was going to be attached to a small helicopter and then flown all around the range uh, by contractors sampling lava and that kind of thing, which they might see on the moon. On board was the pilot, and then there was an engineer, and they were both in white coveralls. So to us, that, you know, that identified it almost perfectly. It's too much of a coincidence. Two guys in white coveralls that were doing the mission anyway, and then the sampler, which left a, a print in the dirt that was identical to what it later left on the moon. I find it hard to believe Gildenberg's explanation. Zamora was a trained police officer, and I'm sure would have known the difference between a helicopter and a flying saucer. To try and make sense of what Zamora saw, we need to go back to the U-2 and to an event that shook the world in 1960. When U-2 pilot Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union, Cold War tensions intensified. The wreckage of his spy plane was put on public display in Moscow. This was a huge propaganda coup for Khrushchev, and it signaled the end of the U-2's covert life. It was understood very early in the U-2 program that it wouldn't be able to fly safely over the most denied areas of the Soviet Union forever. Uh, best, it was given a few years. Um, in fact, it flew operationally for just about four years, which was longer than anybody expected, before one of the aircraft was shot down. The CIA uh, launched an effort to produce a more workable aircraft with similar or better performance, and one that would be so fast and so high flying that even the best missile technology that anybody could be looking at in those days would have a very hard time hitting it. Richard Bissell was head of the CIA's overflight program between 1956 and 1960. He was the man given the job of replacing the U-2. He had a radical idea about how this might be achieved. We see here that he's urging his technical department to design a new aircraft for reconnaissance missions over Russia. According to Bissell, who had a very good grasp of the technological challenges, the optimal shape for that vehicle would be saucer shaped. <laughs> The Avro car, which appears for all the world to be a flying disc. It wasn't just Bissell who had flying saucers on his mind. Just across the border, Avro, a Canadian-based company, had recruited talented British aerospace designer John Frost to work on a flying saucer. Frost was a visionary, and under his leadership, the company began experimenting with disc-shaped craft. Called the Avro car, it was a handful to fly and could barely get off the ground, but it caught the eye of the United States Air Force. They bought all rights to the project, and then it simply disappeared. Nothing more was heard or seen of Avro's saucer designs for over 40 years. But flying discs did not die with the Avro car. Buried in the depths of the archives, I've discovered some blueprints which reveal something quite fantastic. A supersonic saucer. Called the Silverbug, it was truly revolutionary. The plans show in detail a multi-jet engine craft that boasted amazing maneuverability and speed. 
It's an intriguing thought that this concept may tie in with the work of the German scientists who brought saucer technology to the US at the close of the Second World War. I believe Silverbug could explain what Lonnie Zamora witnessed in the New Mexico desert in April 1964. His description of a silver disc-shaped object appears to fit in with the Silverbug profile. There's plenty of evidence that a host of other covert technologies were being developed by the Air Force during the 1960s. And many of the sightings on record at the time can be traced back to their secret testing programs. But I've heard there was a significant rise in sightings in the UK at the same time. Could the two be linked, or was the British phenomenon part of something completely different? I'm going back to the UK to find out. I've decided to hunt for any evidence that the British government were concerned about UFO sightings. As an aerospace journalist, I've spent many hours poring over old Ministry of Defence memos. They are a revealing record of how past British governments reacted during times of high tension and paranoia over national security. There's a really sort of fantastic, um, typical British understatedness about all these reports emanating from the MOD round about the 1950s and 60s about UFO sightings. We have memos here from Winston Churchill, for example, who was Prime Minister in 1952, saying, what does all this stuff about flying saucers amount to? What can it mean? What is the truth? Let me have a report at your convenience. Fantastic. Lord Charwell, head of the Air Ministry, drafted this reply to Churchill. It was typically dismissive. It explained UFO sightings as deliberate hoaxes, optical illusions, mistaken identification, or known astronomical phenomena. But Charwell was not privy to US intelligence. He had no idea how the increase in UFO sightings in America could be linked with secret developments in defence technology. Here we have quite an interesting file from the MOD. The numbers of unexplained, in inverted commas, aerial sightings reported to the Ministry of Defence from 1959 until 2000. The sightings rise modestly from 1959 when you have 22 sightings, and then up to 95 in 1966. But in 1967, they really jump. They jump from almost 100 to 362 sightings, which is really quite significant and remarkable. <laughs> 